Welcome back to Econ 104 Introduction to Macroeconomics. In this video, we're going to be primarily taking a look at the distinction between real and nominal variables. So with that, primarily we'll be taking a look at the difference between real and nominal GDP. We will also briefly expand this discussion, however, to be taking a look at real versus nominal rates of change, such as real versus nominal interest rates. Goals for this is, well, of course, first to start off, we'll differentiate between real and nominal GDP. We're also going to look at how to track real GDP over time. That is how to convert nominal to real and see how it changes over time, as well as how to compare real GDP across different countries using exchange rates and accounting for that. So without further ado, let's go jump over and distinguish between real and nominal variables. So to start off, let's take a look. Let's define what exactly we mean by real and nominal. So real versus nominal. So nominal prices, nominal GDP, nominal variables are what we are used to. When you go into McDonald's and they say, hey, the price of a cheeseburger is $2.48. That is the nominal price. That is the price in today's dollars. Real prices then are the prices that we've adjusted for those changes. And so a real variable is something that is displayed in base year dollars. That is, it is something that is adjusted for inflation. And in order to really kind of bring to light why this is important, let's go back to our early kind of situation of a very simple economy where we have two different farmers and these two different farmers are growing apples and oranges. And between this, we had our quantity in kilograms and I believe we had something like 100 kilograms of apples and 125 kilograms of oranges. Now, initially, our price in dollars was $2 per kilogram of apples and $1 per kilogram of oranges, giving us our total value or our total expenditure on each one. 100 times 2 being 200, 125 times 1 being 125, giving us our value of GDP of $325. That's the value, that is our total expenditure, and also our total income generated within this <clears throat> economy given the period of interest. But, okay, here's the problem. As we know, as we've witnessed in life around us, especially with things like apples and oranges, these prices are hardly stable. They're hardly stable at all. That is, what would happen if we move forward, and let's say we move forward just maybe a year, maybe just another period, whatever that is, and let's say that our prices update. This is now... $2.50 a kilogram, and oranges, all of a sudden oranges, they spike to, this is now, let's say, a buck fifty. So they both raised by 50 cents. Well, we have an updated total expenditure, the total amount being expended or bought or the income received through apples and oranges. So for apples, we have 100 times 250 is going to be 250. And on the other side, we have 125 times 150, giving us 187.5, so $187.50, giving us our total expenditure of 187.50 plus 250, 437.50. Right, and again, this is measured in dollars. So there we go. So what's happened? We take a look at this and wow, look at how much our GDP has increased by. Look at how drastically we've had an increase in our GDP. I mean, if we work this out, this is, this is going to be pretty huge. We have a GDP of 437.50. We used to have a GDP of 325. 
divide that by our, our original GDP of 325, and we get uh, 112.50 all over 325. That there equals for us 34.6. That is a 34.6% increase in GDP. That is massive. That looks like, wow, our GDP is just exploding. We're having massive GDP growth. This is, this is good, right? GDP growth. This is what we want as a nation. But wait a minute. Have we actually? Keep in mind what we're really trying to measure with GDP is we're trying to measure our amount of output, right? Gross domestic product, GDP. Product being how much stuff is produced. Keep in mind, the stuff we've produced has actually stayed the same. That is, there's no change in the quantity produced. We're still producing 100 kilograms of apples. We're still producing 125 kilograms of oranges. The only change is the prices of these. And thus is one of our problems with measuring GDP, is that because it depends on both the quantity produced and the value of what's produced, is that a change in one doesn't necessarily give us any kind of insight as to what's actually happening in the one we're interested in. All we witness is an increase in GDP, but hey, was this due to an increase in prices or was this due to an increase in quantity? Sometimes what might actually happen is prices go up and they go up so much, quantities actually fall, but due to the drastic increase in price, GDP still rises, right? And that's, that's problematic. So first of all, what we've done here, we have just shown nominal GDP. And in fact, what we've just shown here is the change from 325 to 437, we have shown the change in nominal GDP, where, right, again, if that's a new little symbol for you, that little triangle, Greek letter delta, typically used to denote the change in a variable. So in this case here, the change in nominal GDP was $112.50. That was how much it changed by. Okay. Problem with nominal GDP was that increase due to prices? Was that increase due to quantities? What we need to do is we need to adjust for that and we need to focus on instead what we would refer to as real GDP. And that is real GDP. It aims to hold prices fixed in some base year. Whatever base year we choose, that's entirely up to us. We can pick a base year in which to fix our prices. Once these prices are fixed, then, well, any change in GDP is due entirely to a change in quantity because, of course, the prices are fixed. So in that case there, even though prices changed, we would have kept measuring them in what I would call P0, P0 for our base year, and that is I would have kept that at 2, I would have kept that at 1, and even though the prices changed, who cares? we're still measuring GDP based off of our base year prices. And in that way there, our measurement of GDP, our measurement of real GDP is only changing if our quantities change, which keep in mind is really what we're trying to measure. We're trying to measure how much stuff, how much output we produce as a nation, as an economy. So real GDP being the better kind of the better variable, the better statistic to utilize in order to have this estimate of the amount of production. So how exactly do we account for this? Well, there's a few ways that we can do this. One of the ways that we do this is utilizing a tool known as the GDP deflator. And most of the time, what you can do is you can go and you can do a Google search and you can Google search for, hey, what is the current value of the GDP deflator in Canada? And we'll give you a historical GDP deflator over time. You can do the same thing. Hey, what's the GDP deflator in the US, in this country, in the Eurozone, in India, in et cetera, et cetera, right? You can look these up. These are reported. These are collected. These are calculated by the central statistics agencies in each respective country. 
outside of that, they're also checked. They're also calculated independently through the UN, through um, the World Bank, et cetera, et cetera, the World Trade Organization. Lots and lots of independent calculations of this. They all are pretty similar to each other. The idea behind it, though, is that the GDP deflator is equal to nominal GDP, nominal GDP all over real GDP. That is nominal GDP, the current value of output in today's dollars, real GDP, the value of today's output in some base year dollars, in whatever base year we've chosen. You'll always see if you look up a value for the GDP deflator, there's always a base year. I'll say GDP deflator, base year 2012, base year 2002, something along those lines. It'll always tell you in what base year they are referring to, that is in what year they fixed their prices for this real GDP. That is, if we want to think about this a different way, we can work out this GDP deflator as the summation, that little squiggly kind of almost looks like an E, that's the Greek letter sigma, meaning the summation, meaning add everything together. So add together all of the prices today of all of our goods times the quantities today of all of our goods. Hey, that's, what is that? That's what we did here, right? We did price times quantity was 200. Price times quantity was 125. Then, so we did price times quantity, price times quantity, then we summed them, that is, we added them up to get 325. That's all this is saying to do in math speak, is take all of your goods, take the price times the quantity, next good, price times quantity, next good, price times quantity. Okay, we get the point. We do that for everything. We then add up all of those price times quantities, and we get our nominal GDP. We then take that and we divide it by the summation of our prices in the base year, so P naught, times our quantities produced today. So P naught times quantity today. Our value of the GDP deflator, you'll see this reported in two different ways. You'll see our GDP deflator sometimes reported such that our base year equals one. And so as you move forward through time, typically it will go one something to like 1.2, 1.35, and I'm just making up numbers, right? If you're like, oh, where's he getting that from? I'm just entirely making them up as I go through. So if the GDP deflator is calculated based off of this, base year is one, and then we just move forward through time. And of course, the reason why that base year would be one is because price today and price base year are one and the exact same thing. So always one in your base year. The other way that you'll often see the GDP deflator reported is as an index. And the only difference there is that they take this and they go times 100. And so if you take and you go times 100 in this format, and let me just change colors to green. So if we go times 100, well, in that case, our base year would be equal to 100. And as we move forward through time, that would be 120, 135, 151, right? So just a scale difference between the two, depending if it's being reported as an index, base 100, or if it's being reported just as it was initially, and with a base year of one. And again, depending on what you look up, you will see it occur as one or the other. The common way is for this to be displayed as an index. That is the way that I've written it in the green there. 100 as a base year and then scaling up from there. Time to time though, if you look up GDP deflator, you will see it as we have it in the white. So just to be aware, two common ways in which to see it. The green way is by far and large the one you'll see the most. Okay, so how exactly do we correct from one to the next? How do we get our nominal GDP into real GDP? Well, the way that we can do that is by saying, hey, our GDP deflator is just nominal over real 
If it's the green case, it's nominal over real times 100. So keep that in mind. If it's the white case, well, all we have to do is just a little bit of algebra. That is, notice we can just swap real and GDP deflator. That is, if we multiply both sides by real GDP, divide both sides by GDP deflator, we'll get the following. We'll get real, and actually let's just use our shorthand for this, real GDP, right? So a little R for real, and then GDP is going to equal nominal GDP all over my GDP deflator, right? And that'd be the case if we have our white case, where we're just saying, hey, nominal over real, price today, quantity today, over price base, quantity today. If we want to go about it our other way, well, we can do that. What we would do is we would start off, we would get our real GDP, right? Just the same as we did before, would be equal to nominal GDP all over our GDP deflator. And then again, we would just have this times 100 kicking around. So how do you know which one to use? Well, if you have a GDP deflator that's really being showing up as values of hundreds, well, then yeah, you're using this index form. If you're getting values of the GDP deflator showing up in values of ones, right? Maybe you have like something like a 2.6, maybe in an extreme case, maybe you're looking even like at an eight. Well, then in that case there, well, you're looking at just this white case and you don't need that times by 100. So let's take a look at an example of this. Well, let's go and take a look at Canada. So let's go and create a little bit of a table here. So in Canada, let's look at the following years. Let's take a look at 20, and we'll take a look at two-year gaps, 2015, 2017, and 2019. So three different years. In these three different years, we had the following GDP deflator. So the following value of the GDP, GDP deflator. And we'll keep in note here that our base year was 2012. That is, in 2012, the GDP deflator was 100. What do we have? We have, in 2015, the GDP deflator was 105.70. In 2017, it was 108.30. And in 2019, it was 112. Okay, so value of the GDP deflator. What we also had is we had our values of nominal GDP. And keep in mind, often I'm writing it explicitly here, N for nominal GDP. Often, if we're just referring to nominal GDP, it'll be written as just GDP. We won't define it specifically as nominal. If it's just GDP, typically that's nominal. If we want it to be defined as explicitly real, then it's typically when we'll put the R in front of it. So our nominal GDP, we had, let me take a look at this here. We had a nominal GDP of, in 2015, 2.03. And let's say here, this is trillion dollars. So 2.03 trillion dollars. In 2017, that jumped up to 2.13. And then in 2019, that jumped up again to 2.33. So we see that nominal GDP is rising over this, over this four-year period. Okay, let's go and work out nominal GDP is rising, but what's happening to our real GDP? So real GDP. Again, this will be in trillions of dollars. If we want to work this out, well, what was our situation? We said real GDP was going to be nominal GDP all over our GDP deflator, and then we'll times it by 100. So 
Well, let's work through this here. What do we have? We're going to have, starting off, 2.03 divided by 105.70. And then times by 100. What does that yield for us? Well, let's work that through. 2.03 divided by 105.70 times that by 100, and we get 1.92 trillion. So we see 1.92 trillion. What exactly does that mean? Why is this less than that guy there? Because essentially in this case here, keep in mind our GDP deflator is being held constant in 2012. That is, we're saying, okay, GDP in 2015 prices, so the GDP in 2015 in 2015 prices was just over $2 trillion. However, the value of all that stuff produced in fixed 2012 dollars is only $1.92 trillion, right? So that is a lot of this increase is just due to increased prices, not necessarily due to increased quantities. As we carry forward, we're going to do the same thing. So instead so of 2.03, we'll do 2.13, that is our 2017 amount, divided by that guy, that is our GDP deflator in 2017 of 108.30. And so we worked that out, times it by 100, and we get a real GDP of 1.96, okay? Uh, let's keep consistency here. I switched colors. Real GDP, 1.96. Let's work out finally in 2019 what happened. So same idea. We'll do 2.33, the, the nominal GDP in 2019, divided by our GDP deflator, times it all by 100 in the end, and we're going to get $2.08 trillion. So we see that as a result, real GDP is increasing a little bit slower than nominal GDP. That is, if we wanted to work out our percent changes, our growth rates, as it were. So if we did that, final minus initial divided by our initial value. So 22.13 minus 2.03 divided by 2.03, that would give me something like 4.92%. So just under a 5% growth rate in our nominal GDP over that two year span. What about the next two year span? So value final minus value initial divided by value initial. So 2.33 minus 2.13 divided by 2.13. That would give us almost a 9% change in GDP over that two year period. Well, let's compare that to how fast real GDP grew. All right, so keep in mind, this is partly growth in prices, partly growth in output. Real GDP, we're holding prices fixed now, so this is purely change in output. So final minus initial divided by initial, we get a 4% Increase, and then same idea here, final minus initial divided by initial, we get a 6% increase. So that is between 2015 and 2017, we increased our output by 4%. We produced 4% more things, more stuff from this year to that year. Between 17 and 19, we increased our stuff by 6%. Right, so by looking at real GDP, we can look at the actual amount of stuff, the amount of things, the amount of goods we've actually produced. That's our idea there with real GDP. Okay, so that does us for our distinction between real and nominal GDP. What we can also take a look at is our kind of business cycle and how these things move through time. That is, in this case, all that we've looked at, if we want to kind of graph this, Let's take a look at our real GDP here. Ah, let's make that a straight line. Over this short bit of time that we've looked at, if we put GDP 
uh, real GDP on the vertical axes, and we put time on the horizontal, we'll see that really all real GDP has done over this time period is kind of something like this. So, right, a little bit of increase, a little bit of increase, and a little bit of a sharper increase there. So that would be something like 2015, 2017, 2019, and that was real GDP increasing. What we can also look at, though, is over a longer stretch of time, something that we would refer to as our business cycle. And that is, okay, sure, over this four-year period, yeah, GDP, real GDP, had this nice, healthy, upward trend. What happens over a longer time period, though? Well, what we witness over a longer time period is something that's more like this. So again, let's put GDP, and again, we'll focus on real GDP on the vertical axis, and we'll take a look at time on the horizontal. What we tend to witness, and this is going to be highly stylized on purpose, is we tend to witness something more like this. That is, we have periods where the economy is expanding, it is increasing, and then we have periods where it starts to contract a little bit, where it starts to level off. Then the economy expands again, and then it starts to level off. Honestly, if we bring into this, oh, I just erased the whole thing here. Let's see if I can bring it back. There we go. If we kind of bring into this a little bit more of what we've seen kind of say in 08, 09, or the little blip we had with the pandemic, honestly, this looks something more like this. where we can actually erase earlier period gains momentarily through massive contractions and then the upward trend once more. So again, highly stylized, but what we witness with this is our business cycle or what is often known as this boom and bust cycle of the economy, where we expand and then we contract, where we expand and then we contract, where we go through this up and down of output as we move through time. Now, a lot of our course going forward is going to look at explaining this boom and bust cycle, explaining this business cycle from one viewpoint. Uh, if you are interested, there's actually many competing viewpoints that attempt to explain this business cycle or this boom and bust. We will be taking a look at it from one fairly mainstream view on this. Uh, again, there's not necessarily a clear consensus. There's always disagreement, but it's a strong consensus along the lines that this explains pretty well, at least in a simple introductory way, a way that we can explain the business cycle. At the higher levels, if you go on with macro, of course, you'll take a look at more complex models that do a better job of explaining this. Now. With this, what we're going to have is we have expansions where the economy is going up and we have contractions where the economy is, well, contracting, going down. What we're also going to be taking a look at as we move on through in the semester is a term known as expansionary gaps as well as recessionary gaps. And expansionary, we can also synonymously call these inflationary gaps. So two kind of terms for that one there. And to keep in mind, these expansionary or inflationary gaps versus recessionary gaps, they are not the same thing as expansions and contractions, even though, hey, expansionary expansions, uh, it's right, a little bit of overlap there, but very different terms. What do we mean by these expansionary gaps or these recessionary gaps? Well, what we can imagine is that there was some relatively stable value of real GDP. Let's put it something like, I will say, maybe something like that. There we go. Maybe that fits pretty good. And this here, we'll call this 
potential GDP. Now, don't get too caught up with this idea of potential GDP yet. Where does it come from? How do we measure it? What is it measuring? No, 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 no. Don't get too caught up with that yet. We will get there. For now, just keep in mind, we have this concept of potential GDP. In cases when our actual GDP is below potential, so I'll shade these cases in in red, actual is below potential, that is, it doesn't matter, are we contracting or are we expanding, right? Contracting, going down, expanding, going up. Well, in both cases, we're still below the potential. In those cases there, we would say we are in recessionary output gaps. Our output is less than the potential output. Alternatively, in other situations, we are going to have these cases such that output is above potential. That is up here. That is up here, what I have highlighted in the blue. Again, it doesn't matter if we are expanding or contracting, expanding or contracting. If real GDP is above potential GDP, well, we would say that we are in inflationary or expansionary output gaps. And that is there's a gap in output between what we're actually producing, real GDP, and potential output, potential GDP. And again, you're like, what is potential GDP? Feel free, go look into that concept ahead of your time if you're really digging to know what that is. Otherwise, just put it on the back burner for now. We will get there. We'll spend a lot of time on it, trust me. So just kind of leave that in your back pocket for now. Really what we're taking a look at is how real GDP can move through time with relation to this potential and this whole idea of the business cycle. That's the big takeaways here. Okay, final thing to take a look at in this video. Final thing we want to take a look at is the comparison of GDP across different countries. So let's take a look at that. So we've taken a look at ways in which we can compare GDP through time. And that is when we compare GDP through time, we need to hold our prices fixed so that we can actually just compare stable prices and evaluate how output has changed. The question then comes, how do we compare GDP, that is output, from one country to another country? That is, if each country is measuring their GDP in their own currency, and their own currencies are fluctuating at their own rates, and their outputs are fluctuating at their own rates, how about do we go to find a stable metric for comparison there? Well, really what we need to do is, first, first step, just like we did with comparing GDPs across time, we need to go from, oh, that helps if I use the right tool here, we need to go from nominal GDP to real GDP. This way here, we can be sure we are comparing GDP to GDP, output to output across countries. Preferably, we would like this to be done with the same base year, but often that is hard to actually accomplish depending on which base year statistical agencies have used. Using GDP deflators from the World Trade Organization, the UN, etc., they'll often utilize the same base years across their entire data sets, which greatly help with our ability to do this. So what we would want is we would want to collect the value of the real GDP, let's say in Canada, and we'll say the real value of GDP in Canada in 2019. So earlier we had calculated this to be $2.08 trillion. Trillion Canadian dollars. Similarly, let's say we wanted to compare this to the USA, and the US has a real GDP in 2019. So we'll go USA. And theirs works out to be a little bit bigger, $18.82 trillion. So, okay, a little bit of a magnitude difference, but keep in mind the difference here. 
This is 2.08 trillion Canadian dollars. This is 18.82 trillion US dollars. That is very different units of measurement. In order to actually be able to compare Canadian to American GDP or Canadian to the GDP of Britain, India, China, any other country, Australia even, we would have to adjust for exchange rates. And typically the way that we express exchange rates in economics is going to be in terms of how much, how many domestic units of currency do I need to buy a single foreign unit of currency, right? And that is we're always thinking about exchange rates in terms of, hey, what is the cost for a single US dollar? What is the cost for a single Australian dollar? What is the cost for a single pound, great British pound, right? Cost of a single euro, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as we go through it. How many Canadian dollars do I have to give up to get one US dollar? So as the point of putting this through, our exchange rate, and that is Canadian dollars to US dollars, our exchange rate was sitting at 1.27. That is, it cost $1.27 Canadian to get a single US dollar. From here, what we want to do is we want to go and want to convert one of these into the other one's dollars. And we can go either direction depending on what we wanted to do. And what's often helpful is to kind of keep track with this that this is 1.27. Well, 1.27 what? This is 1.27 Canadian. To US dollars. That is, as we go through our math to kind of work through this, I can go, okay, real GDP of the USA, so 18.82 US dollars times my exchange rate, 1.27 Canadian. To US dollars and here's the important bit look at what happens we have US dollars in the denominator we have US dollars in the numerator those two are going to cancel each other out so we have a unit list number here 18.82 times 1.27 Canadian that will yield for us our value in Canadian dollars and that is 23.9 trillion dollars. That is the real GDP of the USA in Canadian dollars, and I guess in 2019 is going to be 23.9 trillion dollars. So comparing that now, we get a lot more of an apples to apples comparison. We can say both of these, that's the U.S. economy in Canadian dollars versus the Canadian economy in Canadian dollars, 2.08 trillion, and again, Canadian dollars. That is, when we take a look at that, we can now compare and we can say, hey, yeah, you know what? The U.S. economy, well, that's going to be approximately... Uh, what, approximately 8.53 times larger than Canada. So that is the U.S. economy is approximately 8.53 times larger than the Canadian economy. So, okay, they have a bigger economy. We get it. Keep in mind, though, truthfully, they also have a population that's about 8.5 times bigger. So... Okay, more people, more people able to produce more stuff, more people able to consume more stuff. So if you looked at kind of a metric of real GDP per capita, that is real GDP per person, well, we might not see as drastic of a difference any longer. There is still a slight difference between the two, of course, but 
it disappears. It's not as drastic as what we saw in this case here. So another way that we can compare across countries is working out what is that real GDP per person, real GDP per capita. And it's a way to kind of average the nation's income across all the people. So another way that we could compare. Okay, that does us for this video. Again, what were the big things of this? We were taking a look at the distinction between real and nominal variables. Again, keeping in mind, real variables are priced in constant base year dollars. Nominal variables, they're priced in today's dollars. That is, they're staying the same. They're not staying the same. Prices are going to fluctuate as we move through time. In real cases, no, we're holding prices constant. So that's the big distinction there. Above and beyond that, we took a look at how we can look at GDP through time. To look at GDP through time, ideally, we want to look at real GDP through time. That is, so we can look at how actual output has changed as we move from one year to another. Not just, hey, was that change due to prices or was that due to output? No, with real GDP, we can be sure it was due to a change in output. Finally, we took a look at how we can compare GDP across countries. To compare GDP across countries, first, we often want to compare real GDP. We want to account for their exchange rate to turn them both into the same dollar or the same currency unit of measurement. And then finally, if we wanted to, to kind of really get a GDP per person, that is GDP per capita measurement, we could divide that total GDP measurement by how many people are in the country altogether to get an idea of GDP per capita. That is how much income, how much expenditure, how much output there is per person residing in the country. Okay, if you have any questions with anything that we've gone through here, of course, please feel free to reach out to me. You can comment below on the video. You can post on our D2L Frequently Asked Questions page. Or, of course, feel free to give me a shout through email. Thanks. Until next time.